guys. In this video, we're going to talk about areas between curves. So in previous videos, as you know, we had one function and we found a net area. In this section, we're doing genuine positive area, just regular area in between two functions. So that means we do need to figure out which function is on the top and which function is on the bottom. So of course, we're going to have to practice our basic graphing skills. Remember how to graph e to the x, sine of x, polynomials, all that good stuff. And what we're going to do is figure out which function is on the top and which function is on the bottom. And then you're going to construct an integral and figure out the integral. Suppose we wanted to find the area between f of x and g of x from x equals a to x equals b. Now let's just suppose that this is a function f of x and this is the function g of x from x equals a to x equals b. So in this picture, the area in question is this dotted region. If we use the logic of Riemann sums and basic geometry, then we could start by subdividing the x-axis into a bunch of subintervals, where the a is the x naught, then we have x1, x2, x3, etc., and the b is xn. So here n is the number of rectangles. Now suppose that we were using a left Riemann sum. Here the first rectangle on the first interval, the height of the region should be using these functions f of x and g of x at the left-handed endpoints. The first rectangle would look something like this. We can proceed in this manner. Since I'm using n rectangles and n is not specified, I will not fill up the whole region with rectangles. But anyways, you get the idea since we've done this before. Now each rectangle has width change in x. What is the height from here to here? So f of x minus g of x will give me the height of this first rectangle. The next step in the process is that we would add up all of the rectangles, starting at i equals zero for the first rectangle and ending at n minus one. Remember that for the last rectangle, which is not drawn here, we'll be using the n minus one endpoint for the left hand of the last rectangle. So this this ends at n minus 1. Now, if we wanted to get the exact area, we would have to take the limit as n goes to infinity of this quantity. So that's the Riemann sum formulation. We could certainly estimate by picking n is equal to 10 or n is equal to 100, but the closer we get to infinity, the better the estimation. This is exactly a definite integral. This is the definite integral of f minus g, and the change in x kind of turns into the dx after you take the limit. Now this is the way we will calculate areas in between curves. So in general, the step is first draw everything. Then you have to identify uh, what's on top and what's on bottom. Then you have to put together the definite integral and then calculate the integral. Notice that as usual, the left x value is on the bottom and the right x value is on the top. So this is my cute little way of formulating the area between two curves. You take the top function minus the bottom function integrated from the left x value to the right x value. For your everyday calculations, say on the homeworks, you'll be using this boxed equation, but I hope you understand it comes from Riemann sums. We will be using fundamental theorem of calculus in order to do these problems. We're going to find the area between x squared minus 3x and y equals x plus 5. This is strange. The problem doesn't say what the x value values are. Okay, well let's just continue with the problem and see what happens. So what does the graph of x squared minus 3x look like? Well, it's clearly a parabola because of the x squared, and if I factor it into x times x minus 3, then I can see where it hits the x-axis. Notice that the height is equal to 0 if either x is equal to 0 or x is equal to 3. Now let's draw y is equal to x plus 5. That's a line with slope 1 and y-intercept 5. My drawing's not that great, but that's okay. As long as things are labeled correctly, that's good enough. If we're talking about the area in between the line and the parabola, oh, the reason why the x values aren't included in the statement of the problem is because they're clearly delineated by the intersections of the curve. So here, it's assumed that I will figure out the x values myself by figuring out where 
where the two functions intersect. I hope you remember how to solve for x in this scenario. What you do is you move everything to one side, set it equal to zero, and then go from there. So let's subtract x on both sides of the equation. Now let's subtract five on both sides of the equation. How do you solve for x if a polynomial is equal to zero? Well, either you can factor it if the numbers work out nicely and if it's factorable. By the way, if that doesn't work for whatever reason, then you can use quadratic formula. But in this case, it does easily factor into x minus 5 times x plus 1. So it looks like our x values are x equals 5 and x equals minus 1. That actually matches up with my picture pretty well. x equals minus 1 is over here and x equals 5 is over here. Awesome. So what am I doing to solve this problem? I'm looking for the integral from minus 1, the left intersection point, to 5, the right intersection point. Top function is x plus 5. 5, and the bottom function is x squared minus 3x. There we go. That's the integral we're supposed to be doing in order to find the area. Now I do want to mention parentheses. When we say the bottom function, we mean it. The whole bottom function in parentheses. So what's going to happen is that this minus sign will distribute through the bottom function. Okay, let's do the work here. Nobody's going to tell me to simplify this problem. I just have to notice that things would be easier if I kept it organized. I'm going to keep the biggest power in front. I'm going to add up x plus 3x to give me 4x and then plus 5. Okay, now I'm going to take the antiderivative. We've got a 4 divided by 2 over here. Might as well simplify that before I start plugging in numbers. Okay, now let's plug in 5 and plug in minus 1 and subtract. The final answer is 36 if you add up these numbers. Double check it for yourself. Our final answer is supposed to be a positive number. We did subtract the top function from the bottom function in order to give us a positive height and then we integrate it from the left to the right. Everything's positively oriented so it looks like everything makes sense. The area of this region is 36. Let's do another problem. This one we're gonna find the area of the region bounded by absolute value of x and x squared minus 2. Of course we want to start by drawing. I'm gonna take the x squared graph and shift it down by two units. Now do you remember Remember what the graph of the absolute value function looks like? Let's just do a brief little aside here. If you take the absolute value of 5, that's 5, right? Okay, that's already a positive number. If you take the absolute value of negative 5, that is also 5. But how do you obtain that? You negate the negative 5 in order to get positive 5. So the absolute value of x is equal to just x if x is greater than or equal equal to zero, or negative x if x is less than zero. Now this is exactly how you graph the function. If x is positive, then the absolute value is just graphing y equals x. For x negative over here, we're graphing y equals negative x. The absolute value function ends up being a v-shape. Okay, similar to the previous problem, let's go ahead and find the intersection points. Over here on the right side, x squared minus minus 2 is intersecting the positive x function. We can use the symmetry of the problem. Whatever this x value is on the right, the negative of it is on the left because both of these graphs are symmetric. They are both even functions, x squared minus 2 and absolute value. Now solving for x, we'll move everything to the left. By the way, if it doesn't work, if the numbers are too hard, don't forget you can always use the quadratic formula. We got x is equal to positive 2 and x is equal to negative 1. x is equal to positive 2 is probably somewhere around here. Oh, it looks like that is the number that we're looking for. What the heck is this x is equal to negative 1? What is happening here is that the y equals x function is coming down and intersecting at this other point, which is, by the way, completely irrelevant for our problem. That irrelevant point occurs at x equals negative 1. So we can discard this x is equal to negative 1. Our other x value, like we said before, is by symmetry. This 
is the negative of two. Our picture is symmetric. All right, so let's put our integral together. We're looking for a top function and a bottom function. There's two different top functions. There's the y equals negative x top function over here, and then over here, there's y equals positive x top function. What we'll do is subdivide this region. From negative two up to zero, the top function is the negative x function, and the bottom function is the x squared minus two. That's region number one. In region number two, the top function is the x function, the positive x function, and the bottom function is, of course, x squared minus two. Now, if you were to do this long calculation, you would definitely get the right answer, as long as you did all of the calculus and algebra correctly. However, there is a slightly easier way for this problem, which is to use the symmetry of the picture. I, you probably already noticed this as I was drawing. Well, if this region and this region are exactly the same area as each other, can't I just find the area of one of these and then multiply times two? That would be way easier. Yes, absolutely. Let's just do the integral from zero to two, and then we'll take that answer and multiply by two. By the way, method one still works. It's just a little bit long-winded. Now, let's calculate this. Take the antiderivative here. That's what I get when I plug in two, and plugging in zero, I actually just get zero for this particular problem, okay? And then, as you can see, everything is multiplied times two at the end due to the symmetry of the problem. The final answer here is 20 over three. Good thing I got a positive number, right? Because this area is supposed to be a positive number. So that makes a whole lot of sense. The next example is gonna take things to the next level. As usual, first step is to draw the problem. Be careful, that's x is equal to y squared. That's a parabola this way. Now let's draw a straight line with negative slope and positive 6 for the y-intercept, something like that. So the area is something like this. Now again, I'll show you two different methods for doing this problem. Now this region is a little tricky here. Over here, it seems clear, right? The top is the blue line and the bottom is the white uh, parabola. But at this point right here, the region to the left over here is a bit more strange. If we think about how graphing functions work, the top part of this parabola is y equals positive square root of x, while the bottom of the parabola is y equals negative square root of x. So in order to do this problem with a method that's similar to our previous two examples, I have to subdivide the region here and do two different parts. In region number one, we'll have the positive square root minus the negative square root for the top minus the bottom. In region number two over here, we'll have the top is the line function minus x plus six, and the bottom is that negative square root function. But unlike the previous problem, we don't have any fun symmetry happening for us. Region number one and region number two are just legitimately different regions. Region number one has the positive square root on top and the negative square root on the bottom for the first integral, and region number two has the line on top and the negative square root on the bottom. We do need the intersection points. Okay, so we're going to set these two functions equal to each other. There's a couple of different ways of doing it. We basically want to set this x equal to that x or that y equal to that y. I'm going to set the x's equal to each other. x is equal to y squared. Now this x should be the same as that x at the intersection point. So let's rewrite this equation as x equals. Adding x to both sides, we get x plus y equals six, and then subtracting y from both sides, we get x is equal to six minus y. So this line equation is essentially x is equal to six minus y. So that's exactly what we're gonna plug in in order to find the intersection point is replace this x 
with 6 minus y. Alrighty, proceeding to solve for y. We need everything on one side of the equation. I'm going to put everything on the right. So I'm going to add y to both sides and subtract 6 from both sides. All right, looks like we can do y plus 3, y minus 2. So we've got two different y values for our intersection point. y is equal to negative 3 and y is equal to positive 2. So let's label everything. If the y value is equal to negative 3, what's the x value? It's 9. The other intersection point has y value positive 2. If the y is equal to 2, then the x is equal to 4. Region 1 here goes from x equals 0 all the way up to the first intersection point, which is at x equals what? It's x equals 4. So from 4 to 9 for the second region. Okay, now this whole problem is done with respect to x. So all of these functions are expressed as y equals. That is something that is common to all of the rest of the problems in this video, problem one and problem two. If you look back, that was a common theme for our previous problems that went unmentioned until now. But what if it was easier to write it as x equals? How could we do this problem differently expressing the function as x equals? That is the new method of integration with respect to y that we want to discuss. Doing it with respect to y is going to be more efficient. Okay, so let's start fresh. Everything's labeled because we figured it out on the previous slide. We've still got the same functions. We've got our intersection points labeled here. So here's what we're going to do. Everyone, as you're watching this video, I want you to tilt your head to your right. You should see that after your head is tilted, the blue line is on the top from that sideways perspective and the parabola is on the bottom from that perspective. This is integration with respect to y. You tilt your head to the side and you do the top minus the bottom with everything being a function of y, not a function of x. That's what makes it integration with respect to y. Okay, so let's just check these things out. Um, here I already have x is equal to a function of y. x is equal to y squared. So that one, I don't need to change anything. Um, this one is in the usual y equal format. So I'm going to change it to x equals. If you flip over to the previous slide, you'll see that we already figured that out. This is the same as x is equal to minus y plus 6. This is the x equals version of the line. So again, tilting our heads to the right. Now our top function with respect to y is minus y plus 6. And our bottom function is the parabola y squared. This is with respect to y. We'll go from the lesser y value to to the greater y value. So we're going to go from negative 3 up to the y value of positive 2. So as you can see, method 2 gave us an integral, which is much easier to figure out. Okay, and plug in the limits and subtract. Our final answer is 125 over 6. Good thing that's a positive number, right? Because we are finding an area. So things are making sense. By the way, I hope that you'll challenge yourself to look at the previous slide and actually do method 1. When you do method 1, do you get the same answer? You should. I hope that you do. So try that out. So I hope you enjoyed this video. We did a little bit with respect to x and with respect to y. In class, you're going to be strategizing to try to figure out which one is the optimal strategy. So review the video one more time before you come to class, and I'll see you soon.